It's time for episode 34 of The Crisis Show here on Google Hangouts and on YouTube, now seen at least once in 100 countries. My name is Rich Klein. I'm president of Rich Klein Crisis Management and the founder and host of The Crisis Show. I'm joined today by my friend and colleague. Uh, he, he is the president of Recover Reputation, which specializes in helping organizations and law firms to improve their online reputation through SEO tools and how to use social media and other things we're gonna talk about today. Uh, his name is Steve Giovinco. Hi, Steve, how are you today? Good, Rich, thanks. Good. I'm doing good, how are, how are you? Good to see you. Steve is in Manhattan across the river for me. I'm in Queens, New York. Uh, and we're gonna to talk today about law firm reputation. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, search engine optimization and what law firms need to do when they're in a crisis. How can they navigate that crisis and start to rebuild their reputation with people like Steve who can help push the bad information down and push the good new content up. And it's not easy today with uh, Google algorithms which constantly change. I'm gonna lead off today with a story that has been in the news that many of you may have heard about and that is the termination of the Rutgers University men's basketball coach, Mike Rice. Uh, got national headlines, the story first broke on ESPN. But there's another angle to the story that caught my attention today. It was the Rutgers, uh, Rutgers faulted their outside law firm for the scandal. An outside counsel, the law firm's name is Connell Foley, LLP. They're in Roseland, New Jersey. And they kind of soft pedaled, at least according to the news reports I've been reading, they kind of soft pedaled the behavior of uh, Mike Rice bef even before the story went public. So Rutgers University, uh, their outside counsel, Connell Foley, which is in nearby Roseland, New Jersey, uh, apparently uh, did an investigation. Uh, the, the firm was hired, according to the LA Times, on November 27th. 2012, they interviewed players and coaches about uh, Rice's behavior. Now, I want to read to you a, a quote from the report that is in the LA Times. We find that many of the actions of Coach Rice, while sometimes unorthodox, politically incorrect, or very aggressive, were within the bounds of proper conduct and training methods in the context of preparing for the extraordinary physical and mental challenges that players would regularly face during NCAA Division I basketball games, the report stated. But the report nonetheless found there was sufficient evidence, uh, ellipsis, that certain actions of Coach Rice did cross the line of permissible conduct and that such actions constituted harassment or intimidation within Rutgers policy adding that uh, athletic director Tim Pernetti could reasonably determine that Coach Rice's actions tended to embarrass and bring shame or disgrace to Rutgers in violation of Coach Rice's employment contract with Rutgers. So kind of a mixed message there, Steve. But what's interesting to me is that here's a law firm that didn't really think about the larger reputation or the eventual fallout of that reputation that could stem from the ESPN tape that got that then of course went viral. So what I, what I want to talk about with you, Steve, is you have this law firm, and I don't mean to just hone in on this one firm, Connell Foley, but there are many firms out there that face this kind of uh, crisis situation, reputation crises every day. So where would you start with them? You, we, you and I looked at some of the search engine results of this firm. What kind of advice would you give them if you were advising them, Steve, to improve their online reputation? Yeah, th thanks. And this is a really good point. It's a really good example of like how law firms really need to think differently going forward. I think. Um, so in this particular, and not to hone in on this particular firm as you mentioned, but doing a quick search, you see that their name comes up first, and then their every other article on the first page, and I think on the second page, comes up with news reports, um, local news, local newspapers, other media sites. So what do you do? How do you address that? And by well, the way, that's, really, that's Steve, I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt you. That's Google sure. News or Google Generic Search? Uh, that is uh, News, Google News. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So it's really a challenge because when um, the whole point is to push down, as you mentioned, all those negative articles off the first page, that's the whole idea of repairing online reputation or this particular as uh, aspect of it. Um, it frankly is really a challenge. Um, the best is obviously not to do it in the first place, but now that it's there, it probably will take a long-term process to remove that, to push those down. So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, it's really like, it, it, it's, it's important to focus on good information and to publish good information um, online as soon as you can and try to mitigate this um, issue. Uh, and some of those things might be adding uh, video content is really important these days, uh, as uh, you and I'm sure many of the listeners and viewers know about, um, as well as, um, you know, the old kind of tried and true thing, tried and true areas of uh, maybe press releases or other content. Uh, you know, and, and to make sure that it doesn't look like it's really trying to game the system because that's really important. Oh, yeah, we've seen that, of course, with things like PO Web and people putting out press releases that aren't really newsworthy. And uh, they, they yeah. as you say, game the system, although I think the uh, search engines like Google and Bing and Yahoo are wising up to people who do that and punishing them when they do, yeah. right? Um, Definitely. Steve, yeah. you know, one of the things I'm, I would suggest, uh, no, no, this is not... Uh, the kind of crisis where you had horrible behavior by the firm. You really had kind of, I would say it was probably a misjudgment, a miscalculation by one of the partners there in soft peddling this, not, but not really thinking ahead of the repercussions. And if I was this law firm, or any law firm, by the way, in this kind of situation with a, with a client that is involved in a national you know, uh, crisis story, if you will, one of the things the law firm could do and this is partially, this would help SEO too, would be to defend its reputation. So, for example, in this case, from what I've read, uh, the president, uh, Bart, Barchi or Barkey, however you pronounce it, of Rutgers, he's in a defensive mode right now. He had a town hall meeting last week to talk about what the university is going to do to try to correct this. Uh, of course, they cleaned house, they got rid of Rice, they got rid of Panetti. Yeah. What I think the law firm, though, has to do here if it feels it has a, uh, a solid ground to stand on legally and ethically, and that is to defend its reputation, to say, look, we gave them the best advice we could, and uh, it's a shame that the university is now blaming us uh, for what we thought was good advice at the time. Or they could say, hey, look, we made an honest mistake, an honest miscalculation, and move on. I doubt that's going to happen. Um, but certainly, any, any story about Rutgers and this investigation, and of course, this is a long-running story. It didn't end with the coach's firing. There's an investigation. There's going to be a new coach, and everyone's going to be watching this for a long time, including the NCAA and every other Division I school, probably Division Two and Three, are going yeah. to be watching this process because it was a real lesson in how university athletics can impact the reputation, the entire reputation of university. Uh, today, of course, we're talking about law firm reputation, but another day we could talk about your role in you know, university reputation. But in this case, I think the law firm, uh, if it stays silent, they're going to keep on, uh, be on, they're going to be on the receiving end of more negative media coverage and more of the pylon, whether it's on Twitter and social media. And of course, the president, who may continue to say, hey, it was, it was the outside counsel's fault. We hired them in November, they gave us bad advice, we took it. Uh, sometimes you even see malpractice suits filed because of this. So that's, a, I'm not saying that Rutgers is going to do that, but we've seen that happen. When a client has gotten bad advice, they sue, their, sue the law firm, and then the law firm gets horrible negative media coverage, and they have to call us to dig them out, I guess. So you, mm -hmm. you have an article called uh, on your blog, Seven Tips for Lawyers to Repair Their Online Reputation. And the first one you have is monitor your online reputation. So d let's drill down into that. When you, when you say monitor, do you mean 24-7? Do you mean once a day or a few times a week? What should law firms of any size be doing to monitor their online reputation? One thing that's important to do is constantly look online and see what is being said about you. So it could be just as simple as going to Google, type in your firm's name or a couple of key uh, uh, practitioners in the firm and see what is said about you. Um, another simpler way is just signing up for something called Google Alerts, and that's a free service. 
you just go to Google, uh, Google Alerts, you just type in whatever phrase or name or company, whatever, and it will give you um, an email alert anytime anything shows up about that entity, about that firm, whatever. And that's a handy way to automatically get notified um, of when something online is being said, you know, what is being said about you and if it's negative and then, you know, next steps is how to respond. But that's the first thing is see if there's something negative out there. Yeah, and I would point out because I've handled a lot of law firm crises over the years, search many different ways. So for example, uh, you, you obviously search the law firm's name pr primarily, but very often you may have one partner involved in the crisis. Uh, so that you also need to search that partner's name. You may also want to search something about the practice area that that lawyer or, or the law firm is involved in, see what comes up because you never know how reporters, bloggers, citizen journalists are going to uh, use your name in their uh, content, if you will. So very important to search multiple ways with quotation marks, without, right? Uh, because it, it does, it does uh, change the results. I've noticed when I search for myself, and I, I don't do it enough, I should, but when I do it, uh, and I put in like rich client with quotes, or without quotes, or my, my business name, it gives you a different algorithm, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea to track a bunch of different areas, a bunch of even key areas in the firm. Um, and it's also a good way to track competitors too, like seeing what they're doing, um, what's being said about them, um, and also other topics too that might be pertinent for your firm. Uh, but definitely monitor uh, if you don't want to sign up for Google Alerts, you know, do this uh, every couple of weeks, really and be on top of things, especially when something, a potential issue is out there or brewing out there or has been released, then be on double alert and, you know, really constantly look maybe every day uh, about things that are being spread out there because something could pop up very quickly and spread very quickly also. Abs absolutely. And I would just add to that, when you're in a crisis mode, and, and by the way, a lot of firms don't see themselves in crisis mode because... They just don't understand the harm to their reputation from a malpractice suit or news like this record situation, which is, which is why we use it as a case study. You have to, when you're in a crisis mode, to really do the searches a few times a day, constantly monitor them, because one news story could pop in the middle of the night in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN, and change the game. Because what I've noticed, Steve, I don't know if you've noticed this too, when there's a traditional media story about you, and it's negative, uh, and you have uh, adversaries out there, let's say, or unhappy clients and or customers, if you're a business yeah. rather than a law firm, you run the risk of a social media wildfire. You run the risk of people tweeting out that story, adding their negative comments, and we've seen this happen. Uh, many stories uh, get out beyond the traditional media, and as we all know, many stories are broken on broken first on social media, such as Twitter, and on Facebook and on YouTube where stories originate and then the traditional media follows it. If you're a law firm just concerned about traditional media and your website, you're going to miss the boat here. So what Steve and I are trying to say is you have to look at this holistically online. It's not just your website. You have to, uh, whether you have a Twitter account or not, and every law firm should, just for the monitoring purposes, you should be looking there as well to see what's being said. Just one other point is that's a really good point that even if something comes up in the traditional media, that doesn't mean that it's going to go away if uh, you know no, there's no reaction to it immediately. Because as you say, something could come up uh, even weeks later, um, uh, lag time, or someone could uh, come across it later. Or actually, a lot of uh, print publications, a lot of them are publishing things right away online, but others take longer. So that story might not hit or be able to be searched or indexed by Google after, until you know, a few days or weeks later. Um, and so then the story could still come up at, that, come up at, a, at a later point. That's a great point. You know, and I would just add that uh, the traditional media, uh, most of the most traditional media, and, and by the way, that, that's going to change very soon. There's not going to be social media, traditional media. It's just media uh, because... Yeah. Uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, LA Times, Miami Herald, all the big, uh, what, what we consider the big metros, if you will, here in the States at least, uh, they are all now online 24-7. So they are putting updates into their stories. They are updating their stories every few hours. They're, they really are 
uh, operating as wire services. So they're doing what the Associated Press, UPI, and Reuters have been doing for many years. And they're, so it's very interesting that in the old days, you, if you had a negative story in one of those newspapers, or Time, or Newsweek, for instance, or a U.S. News World Report, uh, you could assume that once the week, uh, the week, a week had passed, or in the case of a daily paper, the next day, that story is old news. Today, as you know, and I know, and as law firms need to know, those stories live online permanently. And the only question is, are they going to be on top of the search results, or are they going to get pushed down? Right? So that's another uh, yeah. interesting conversation to have. So feel free to chime in on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point because once something is online, it's almost impossible to get offline. Um, I've had, there are some ways you can get something pulled off if it's, uh, you know, if there's violate certain guidelines of a website, um, if there are things that are, uh, you know, uh, publishing personal information or bank account information or other things like that. But basically, once it's online, it's there and it's going to linger there and it's going to show up in searches. So it's really, the point of, as you mentioned earlier, where is it going to be? Is it going to be on the first page of a Google search? That's a disaster or a potential disaster. You know, it could be very, very damaging. If it's on page two or three, okay, it might get found um, you know, a little bit. If it's on page five or four or five, six or further, it effectively doesn't exist. Um, I agree with you. Because, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's just um, one other thing is that I think 90, 95% of clicks occur on the first page of, uh, of a Google search result. So right. that means just a very few people are going to that second page and very few even, even less are going to the third page. So that's the whole point is to move it off the first and second page and effectively making it disappear. You're never going to get rid of it, most likely, but you know, that's the whole point is just to try to make as few eyeballs see it as possible. And that's a you know, way of repairing that damaged information that's floating out there. Yeah, I also want to just turn the conversation slightly here for our viewers' benefit. You know, there's, uh, there are big law firms, there are mid-sized firms, and there are small firms and solo firms. When this happens to a small firm, and I want to give an exa another example here that came up uh, about two months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a, a law firm in New York City called Parker Weichmann, I believe is the pronunciation. And what happened, it has two name partners, uh, and one of the partners was being sued by uh, somebody who worked for him. He was apparently uh, making sexually suggestive comments to her. He threatened to whip her, for instance. Mm -hmm. It was a big piece of the oh. New York Post. Uh, for those of you who in New York, you know the, uh, how the Post handles these kind of stories. Uh, it, went, it went pretty, uh, it actually, <clears throat> it got on Above the Law, which is the most influential uh, legal blog that I know of at least in terms of uh, law firm culture, law firm business. And so there's a situation where you had an, uh, one of the founders of the firm named in this lawsuit for something that's at, uh, at the very least sexist and at, at, very, at, the, at the other end of it sexual harassment and discrimination. So that is still out there for this law firm. And what's really interesting, Steve, is uh, I started to follow this firm uh, online I, uh, on Facebook, and, and they have a YouTube video. Uh, they're a plain, I think they're a um, personal injury firm, and so they keep putting out these videos about all these things that could happen to people, personal injury. But they're they're fighting that. They, they still have to fight this battle here. They haven't really addressed. They, they, first of all, they haven't commented on this at all. They're playing the typical. Uh, you know, lawyer defense, which is, well, we'll deal with this in court and not in the court of public opinion, which I think is a big mistake. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. They're doing, they don't seem to be doing anything about it. Um, and this is something that's going to stick around. You know, people are going to search for this firm and this is going to pop. Uh, and it's going to show up because it was yeah. in the New York Post and because other people picked it up. It's not, I don't think it's on page one anymore. Let me just see quickly. If I put in the firm... Yeah, so this is perfect. So I type in the law firm's name. It's Parker and Weichmann, okay? <coughs> National Personal Injury Firm. The first Google search result, and by the way, this is the web search, not the news search, the one that everybody goes right, to. Right. And the yeah. first result is the law firm, fine. The second search result is the New York Post article. 
which mm. says, mm-hmm. Secretary claims law firm founder Herbert Weichman sexually and its ellipses as the headline. The third was the Martin Del Hubble. So, perfect yeah. example, Steve. Yeah. What I don't know what yeah. they're thinking. You know, how can you uh, promote, pitch, market yourself against us without dealing with this uh, monkey wrench around your neck? You know? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, what would you do with a case like that? Because I yeah. kind of handle things a little bit after the crisis is happening yeah, sure. and work on my uh-huh. area. So what I usually, I just, uh, just throw in here that usually what I do on my side is I generally try to ignore the negative and add positive information because if on my world adding uh, kind of, a, it's not really my job to address the issue. It's kind of, I think your area to address the crisis as it's going on. And my job is to repair it online. But I'm curious, you know, so what, what is your recommendation for something like that? Right, and, and that's why we would be a good team we working on something like this for sure. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I agree with you. I all, but I also think that you have to go to the, the, the root of the problem first. You've got to root out the, the underlying problem that gave you this bad search result. Because as you know, what you do is a challenge to do after the fact. Like you said earlier, it's better they didn't have this kind of behavior, you know, or this kind of mistake, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what this partner was thinking. Uh, this ha- and by the way, it's, it appears this was a secretary, which makes it even worse. It's a tough one. He's a founding partner. But the, the other partner has to find a way to distance himself from this behavior. Because you are not going to build goodwill with the public and get clients with this mm-hmm. out still out there unless you take disciplinary action. It's very hard right. though in many of these law firms, particularly when it's a joint partnership like this, to take any kind of action. This guy really should step aside and take a, mm-hmm. a much lower profile role. That would be the first thing I would do. I would have the other partner come out with a statement that says, uh, while this is being litigated, uh, Mr. Uh, I think it's, let me just get his name correct. Uh, Mr. Weichman has stepped aside uh, to defend his to defend himself, whatever. Then have to go into details of the case, but they should have a reduced role. And you also have an internal audience. Uh, I am sure that every attorney in that firm right now is walking on eggshells because their firm has mm-hmm. been been uh, the target of the negative media coverage because of something their founding partner did, not because of anything they did, and that hurts their ability to do business, to serve clients, to get new business, right? So yeah, I, yeah. so he needs to have a diminished role, and that's something that should have happened as soon as the story broke, within a day or two, the, the other partner should have done something rather than just burying his head in the sand, pretending nothing happened. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think there's actually, uh, there were, it, was the, it was him and there's a few other partners that manage that firm. So it's not just the two, the other people, I believe, I think I went to their website. There were two or three others that have a say in the direction of the, the management of the firm, if you will. And mm-hmm. so something should have happened that gave him a reduced role that reassured clients that this is not acceptable behavior. If, if, it, if, they, if they do acknowledge it did happen, they have to acknowledge it's not acceptable. Uh, mm-hmm. If it didn't happen, you know, it's kind of hard to defend something like this either way yeah. uh, because the yeah. allegations are so you know, juicy, if you will. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can jump in, I think a couple please. of, yeah, I think that's a really interesting, a uh, couple of really great points there. And I think that sounds like a great approach to me because you really, if something negative happened, you do have to address it to show that, you know, you don't agree with that because otherwise being silent is just going to keep things, uh, hey, you didn't say anything. We must assume that something, uh, you agree with it, you know, by, by kind of complicit in the, by your silence. So I think that's a great approach to acknowledge it in some way. And by acknowledging it kind of on my side of repairing the online uh, aspect, that is producing, you know, something that can be uh, published out there um, that, you know, will help to mitigate, mitigate it from being on the top of the first page. You know, you want to, you know, the, uh, the apology can be now, uh, above that negative item and that's beginning to prepare it of course we want to make all of that disappear and and again it's really unfortunate when something is you know it seems like someone did something wrong uh but it's impacting the rest of the firm and the client uh so that's um that's important and by the way uh, i don't have all the information in front of me but there's going to be a trial on this 
uh, I imagine at some point there's going to be, or there'll be a settlement, there'll be some other news cycle. This story's right. not over just because the Post broke the story. There's going to be some other form of closure, if you will, or not. Maybe, yeah. maybe it'll come out there were more allegations, there were more, more people he targeted besides this one secretary. Maybe there was a pattern uh, that yeah. somebody else steps forward, much like the Penn State scandal where you just saw this domino effect of people coming forward, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that's really... Yeah, no, I'll just jump in for a second. I think that's a really interesting point that these things can really continue on. And also one thing you have to think about is we don't know where media or social media, let's say, will be in six months, three months down the road, a uh, year down the road. We don't know how how these stories are going to percolate, uh, if they're going to be so much uh, quicker to get out there, if they're going to linger in a different way. Um, but you just have to be aware that these cycles will come up again and again. And one way to mitigate that is kind of a defensive approach or really just have a good reputation to begin with. And that starts with, you know, making just, uh, just to go backwards for a second, is uh, to prepare yourself um, for a good online reputation because that does two things. One, that provides a really good defense if this issue comes up or if it comes up again. And secondly, it provides information for people that are out there searching for you. And it's really a marketing tool because they want to see that you're a leader in your area of specialty. Um, so it's really important to have a good reputation, have that either cleaned up or have kind of a defensive approach of having um, you know, Twitter accounts, your LinkedIn accounts, um, all of those things set up. And at least with some information out there, maybe you don't have to be a maniac or you know, just kind of jumping in uh, social media all the time or whatever, but to have a presence and to have a decent presence out there is important for those areas. And that's, that's important to think about too. Yeah, that's a great point. I just want to follow up with what you said about the social media angle of this. I just wrote an article for Strategies, which is the Journal of Legal Marketing. Uh, it's the publication of the Legal Marketing Association, which uh, just wrapping up its, its annual meeting in Las Vegas, uh, the LMA. And in the article, uh, the, the cover story was about how to deal with law firm crises. And I had an article in there uh, entitled, How to Use Social Media in a Crisis. And one of the things I pointed out in the article is to set up these accounts long before you think you're going to need them. Lawyers are really resistant to using social media because they don't understand yeah. it. Or they're worried about yeah. the lawyer advertising rules. Or they're worried about yes. ethics and ambulance chasing. And the fact right. of the matter is, it's okay mm -hmm. to set up a Twitter account under your law firm name. It's okay to set up a Facebook page. It's okay to set up a YouTube account. So that if you're in crisis mode, like these firms we just mentioned, and I don't know if Connell Foley or this other firm, Parker Whiteman, has social media properties. But if you have those set up in advance, it's much easier to start distributing content to p start pushing that bad content down, as you say, before you even get to the SEO side of things, because SEO does take some time, as you say. Social media is instant. You can get that stuff out quickly, yeah. and you could start to see some of the positive results uh, within, a, within a few hours. I've, been, I've experienced yeah. that on my own and with clients. So uh, lawyers need to get over this fear of social media. They need to mm -hmm. understand it could be their friend, not their adversary. Really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, with the social media side, um, lawyers might also think that they're getting a lot of uh, clients from recommendations or from like personal contact, which is true. But what a lot of people are doing also is uh, getting the personal recommendations. Then as soon as they're on the phone or off the phone or leave the office, they just do a search. I would say they, if they're doing it. They're doing it before they get on the phone with you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the, yeah. the, the consumer is the most educated now than ever before. You can't trick them. You can't deceive them. It's all out there. They will look for you on LinkedIn probably first. They'll go to your website. Yeah. They'll see if you have yeah. a Facebook page, Twitter, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree completely. And that's but directed for the lawyers who think that, oh, I have all of my work is from, I don't get any recommendations from the web. But it's really, uh, they might not get direct referrals from their website. And Probably, you know, it might be rare any, regardless, but what, the, what people are doing obviously are, as you say, going, looking online almost immediately if you're on the phone with someone, they're Googling your name. If you are not showing up on the first page or if you have very little information there, or obviously, especially if it's negative, 
the phone call is going to be quick. It's or they're not going to get a phone call back. Um, so that's uh, that's also important to get that you know to realize that social media is a really important component for disseminating information, good information, as you say, which can rectify a situation in a few hours or help, and also in help spreading good information about you. Uh, Relation. Um, and one other thing, too, is it's interesting that with the social media side of things, people can, as you say, can make changes in a few hours, really. But if something negative is out there, that could take a long time to repair. So just be aware um, of, of that, that very quickly, again, something can come up there um, from a Twitter. One tweet can really impact uh, a firm or their reputation or their business. Absolutely. You know, I had a... Uh criminal defense attorney, your client, about, about a year and a half ago. And it's a very crowded practice area, particularly in New York. You type in criminal defense attorney and you know, it's a needle in a haystack trying to find somebody. So one of the things yeah. that I did for the client, I suggested it and executed on it, it was very successful and I'm sharing it for the benefit of our viewers, is we created a video around breaking news. So there was this uh, prostitution scandal in Manhattan and he was an expert on sex crimes. And I suggested to him that he comment on video for about a minute and a half, two minutes, about the, the case, what the legal ramifications would be, what are the, you know, who else would be involved in the investigation, what the prosecutors were really after, so on and so forth. We did the video, and that video, if you do search for his name, you won't find him, but if you search for sex crimes in the name of the madam and her name has eluded me but uh, yeah. he's still on top of the search engine results i think we got about nine or ten thousand hits on that youtube video even if you're not in the crisis video is a great way to push your search engine results up and also it connects you with your clients and prospects it's more human just like we're doing now in the show you and i have businesses some people know us from our blogs from our tweets but they don't see us and interpersonal communication uh, mm -hmm. is ideal and people don't do it enough mm -hmm. today so video and by the way as you know all the predictions from all the uh, research firms in the internet industry are saying video is going to grow exponentially in coming years and those who don't do it are going to miss the boat yeah yeah no that's a great point it's great to hear about the success with the video and i think just to uh focus on that for a little bit you're absolutely right i think uh video and visual Items uh, could be uh, photographs, uh, images, graphs, uh, infographics, which is kind of a new term or new kind of popularized uh, area. Things that are visual are great ways to improve your reputation. And Google really loves those things, as you found out, or as you know, um, that video can really, if it's in a very competitive space, like you mentioned uh, with that particular lawyer's field, um, if you write a blog or a posting, that can be on page two or page ten. A video for that same that topic can jump to the top to page one and on the top of that. It's amazing. So that's really, really yeah, and I've seen it, Steve. I've seen it with other clients in, in other industries. Uh, unknown yeah. people who are virtually unknown in, in their communities, in their business, and after doing a video with them, it just took off. Another interesting point is that to take something that's timely, uh, take something that's in the news, I think that's a great idea, um, and have it uh, reflected in a video, because that does two things. You have the video side of things, which Google really likes, as well as the newsworthy side of things, which also Google likes. Because if you think like Google, th and, and think like a cert person who's searching, you want to get the, the most pertinent, fresh, and lively, and interesting, unique information. And as far as, uh, thinking about it on the reputation side, um, that's really the way to go, is really not try to game the system, but really try to produce good, interesting content, video, uh, blog material, or you know whatever it is, but especially video is really helpful. And if it's related to a newsworthy event too, then that also is, you know, can get an extra uh, bump or an extra uh, kind of impact. And yeah. So that's, that's important too. Yeah, you know, it's also just, we're gonna close that in a few minutes. Uh, you know, what's also interesting is things like uh, Pinterest and Instagram. Now, Pint you mentioned infographics yeah. earlier. Pinterest is the, if you will, the, the headquarters of infographics, I think. Uh, uh -huh. Steve, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know if you've seen in your work 
how Pinterest does on search engines. Uh, I'm getting yeah. some good results for myself and my clients on that, but I want to hear from you on the SEO side. Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point, and to bring that up. And if people don't re are, aren't really aware of what Pinterest is, it's really um, get familiar with it. But so it's for an account, it's free. Uh, it's basically images that are posted, um, and you like them and share them, um, and you can kind of follow people. So it's really simple. Um, and it's really effective for the reputation or SEO side of things. So, for example, if um, get an account, and it's part of the idea of building defensively as well, you know, as part of the uh, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn accounts, make sure you have a Pinterest account because that can also help that uh, really substantially. So, I have some clients, they have some negative issues that, you know, they're try I'm trying to help them push off the first page. And Pinterest is really effective. It's one of those. It can take up one of those slots of um, you know on the first page, and uh, it can show up fairly quickly. Um, I've been working on a client. Uh, I think it's now on like the fifth position or somewhere on the first page after maybe a month or two of working with um, posting images and being active because it's important. As with all of these things, as you know as well set up the account and be active, you know, share good information, uh, will help on the social media side as well as all of these building a good reputation and again the whole point is to show that you're an expert in your field uh, so that's one way to do it. Steve, Steve, if you don't mind me asking if you could share with us for our viewers benefit some if you could drill down a little bit into some of the kinds of, of content you're helping clients with on Pinterest so is it infographics, is it photos, uh, because I also know, learned recently you could put videos on Pinterest. So I'm putting the crisis show on Pinterest as well. Oh, I, yeah. I, I have a board there. So I just wonder if you could, like, what would you advise clients how to use Pinterest? That's, uh, yeah, it's always good to know, like, how to best use a tool because each platform is very different or has different kind of aspects that are important. So for Pinterest, um, I've used uh, infographics, as you mentioned, but it's also good for a lot of kind of and if you say kind of mainstream images. So for example, I'm working with a client. Uh, he is in Long Island and has a um, kind of a landscaping uh, related business, let's say. And, and what he did was create a strategy based on uh, kind of fantastic landscapes of Long Island, uh, beautiful houses of Long Island that, you know, might uh, potentially need, you know, kind of landscaping, um, as well as beautiful landscapes, as well as uh, beautiful trees, let's say. Right. So these are things that are not directly related to their business per se, like they're not images that they took, uh, but it's really going after these different categories and sharing them. And what that does is that other people find them, they share them, and they comment on them, they like them, and then that helps boost the Pinterest uh, Kind of link on the Google search results, so that's one example of how it's used. Um, but it's it's kind of like creating almost a narrative about the things that are key to your business, as well as in keeping in mind, most importantly, the other users or clients or you know whoever is going to respond to. Yeah, two things on that. First of all, thank you for sharing that. I think that was very helpful. Uh, I can tell you from growing up on Long Island, people really care about that landscaping. <laughs> you know, uh, my dad had me mowing the lawn and raking the leaves every day, it seems, you know. Uh, people care. Uh, yeah. you know, most people care about their lawns. Uh, uh, not, that's yeah. what's nice about being in the city. We have to worry about that. But we do We do like weed. We just, you know, uh, I have to go upstate for that. I have a nice balance. But for those of you out there who may be curious about Pinterest, I'll share with you uh, my Pinterest uh, board, my, my site, it's Rich Klein NY. If you type in Rich Klein, K L E I N, Pinterest, uh, it'll come up number one, at least for my name. And you can see the kinds of stuff. And it's not, but for me, I, I try to integrate my business and personal life. I'm not one of those people who try to separate that out. I think that's a misnomer people have that you have to have one life here, one life here. I believe people want to do business with people they like and trust, and part of that comes from getting to know you as a human being, not just as, a, as an expert in your field. And so I combine my personal and business life very comfortably. I do it on Facebook. I do it on Pinterest. I do it less so on Twitter. And of course, one of the things I just want to say is that on all these social media sites, 
you can have multiple pages. So Facebook, for example, you have a personal page and maybe you want to protect that because it's friends and family and your kids. And I get that, certainly. We have to worry about security issues when we have children and, and, and loved ones. But you, you also very easily can connect your law firm or business to your personal Facebook page. So you just have a, a company page. And so I do that. Uh, I have a rich client, you know, regular Facebook page. But I also have a page for rich client crisis management and a page for the crisis show. And by the mm -hmm. way, Steve, that, all that, the more that you take advantage of these social media sites, in other words, use them to the max, it's going to help your search engine results too. You're going to be, so if you have a Pinterest account, if you have a Facebook business page, if you have a Twitter feed, uh, if you have a, a, a LinkedIn profile with some, some depth that you could, and of course LinkedIn, by the way, Steve, has also uh, introduced all these great features this past year where you could add uh, slideshow, slide, uh, what's it called, slide share, I think it's called, one of the programs. You could add video. I just added video to my LinkedIn profile. Um, I don't know if that's come up on my search results yet, but it's interesting. And of course, also uh, use uh, sites like WordPress and Blogger uh, and Google and Google Plus. These are all great sites to use to build good content, but also to use when you're in a crisis to uh, put good content up there or to put your defensive statements up there that you need to do uh, to stand your ground to defend your reputation. Because if you don't defend your reputation, yeah. <laughs> your adversaries, uh, either in the media or not in the media, are going to continue to attack you, very likely. You, their tools are out there, and 99% and of them are free, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think there's a lot of great points that you mentioned there. One is also, um, I think it's a great idea to integrate some things, uh, some aspects of your personal life into your business, because as you say, people want to see that you're a human being and a real person, so I think that's a great idea. Uh, for a reputation side of things, that it might be uh, something to think about is to have, you can leverage that by having separate accounts and that can also help boost your online reputation and push down doubly. So if you have two, a personal account and a business account, those might show up when you someone is doing a search. So that might take up two slots on the first page. So that's something uh, to think about. Uh, and that's something I've been kind of uh, working with a little bit as well. Hey, I just did a search for you. I thought we'd use it. So when I search for your name, uh, your website, I think your landscape photography comes up first. You then you have Wikipedia, then you have a Twitter account, then you have Tumblr. Oh, no, another great example. I forgot to mention Tumblr. A lot of media and, and, and artists and uh, storytellers are using Tumblr. I use it. I don't use it enough, but I love the interface. Love it. Uh, and then you see your yeah. Pinterest account and then your Google Plus account. So yeah, I mean, your proof, proof is, is, is right here. Uh, Wikipedia, look at that. Very, very good idea. Put a Wikipedia entry up there. Google Plus. Yeah. 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 And just to uh, pause on Wikipedia too, that's um, a great, those things usually come up first. Uh, maybe LinkedIn, uh, a person's website, and then Wikipedia ranks really, really highly. Um, but however, note that not everyone can go out there and just create their own Wikipedia page. Uh, it might not get published. There are restrictions. Uh, so you do have to have some kind of um, notoriety or not notoriety, but some kind of impact in the community or the business area or wherever. Uh, but that can be really helpful. One other tip to think about, though, is... Can I just interrupt is, you real quickly on that? On the, yeah, I just please, want to stay on Wikipedia for a moment. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just thank you for that because I actually have two uh, relatives, they, they're deceased. I had a great aunt and a great uncle, they were brother and sister, both famous in their own right. One of them was a sports writer for the New York Times, the other was a famous songwriter. When they died, oh. I did a Wikipedia entry and that is, it just stayed up there. Now some of the editors went in and made some adjustments, but they actually added to my entry, they enhanced it. They had done their independent research, they said, yeah, you're, you're legit and we're gonna do more for you, and they did. So thank you for sharing that, but continue. I'm sorry, I just, I just want to get that on Wikipedia. Oh, no, no, I think that's great. Um, one other thing that's, that it's possible to do is that, that if you can't have your own Wikipedia page, and maybe it's not pertinent or uh, you know important uh, for most people, but you can also add information, as you say, to other Wikipedia sites, and that might also uh, be able to leave, you might be able to leave pertinent information about yourself or your blog, you've uh, contributed something 
to uh, something that shows up on Wikipedia. Uh, you can add yourself or edit uh, things and add information, but also have it point back to your site. And that way you also kind of get, uh, Google will find you that way as well. Steve, that's a so that's great an, idea. I never thought of that. That's brilliant because they have on the bottom of the Wikipedia entries uh, sources, right? So for a lawyer, for example, they could go in and comment on the description of a, an area of the law, right? They're an expert in patent law or IP or mm -hmm. labor and employment law, and they could put in their knowledge yeah. of that. With, that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a, yeah, actually, that's a great idea. I haven't really thought of it like that. But yeah, if they wrote a particular piece that's uh, been published, they can add that as a reference. And then that will be picked up by Google. And then also, uh, so that's important for being found in Google. But on the other hand, uh, another aspect is it's showing people, clients, potential clients, whoever, that you're a leader in your field, which again is important to have. You know, that's part of having a good reputation kind of from the start, almost as a defensive way, but again, it's kind of this term that comes up uh, lately is kind of thought leader. And that's, that's something right. that, you know, right. you're a um, leader in your field, leader in your industry, you're publishing things, you're putting out good information, you're writing uh, blogs, but also white papers or other people. And maybe that's a whole other discussion, but yeah. um, that's yeah. something that helps with, you know, building a good reputation, uh, defensively and also as a way to get more clients. They see you as a, a good source and also pushing down negative things if there's a negative uh, reputation that needs to be repaired. Steve, that's a great point about uh, the, the description of thought leadership or also another term is influencer. So you want to build a community of followers uh, and you do that through Twitter, you do that through Facebook, you do that through LinkedIn. You do that through YouTube. You build a following of people, which Seth Godin has aptly called tribes, so that you are mm. thought of as a, as a thought leader and an influencer. And that doesn't mean you're the boss. It means that you are providing a pathway for people to join your community, like-minded people, to follow you as a colleague, uh, as a peer, uh, and somebody they rely on for good information. That's the other thing we're going to close out on is it's not just putting stuff up online and hope it sticks. You got to put good content up and it can't always be about you. In fact, it should be about them. It should be about your critical audiences, whoever they may be. So if you're talking about prospects, if you're a lawyer and you're talking about uh, your prospects or your clients, don't put up your bio and say how great you are or that you won a moot court competition in 1972. You really want to mm -hmm. be talking about the kinds of ways you've helped businesses succeed. You've helped solve their problems. You've you've gotten them out of litigation danger. You've settled cases uh, that were favorable to your client. Uh, those are the kinds of things you want to be talking about. And you want to give people heads up about pending legislation, pending court decisions that they need to be aware of. Traditionally, law firms have done that through paper-based newsletters. Today, mm -hmm. they should be doing that on Twitter and on LinkedIn and Facebook and so forth because that's how people want to get their news. That's how they want to get the information from you. Keep it simple and get rid of the legalese. <laughs> so that's a great point, the idea uh, of lawyers. It's really important for everyone to put out good, pertinent content, but I think lawyers can be uh, specific, have a great advantage. They have a huge breadth of knowledge and they're in a very specialized area. So they can publish really good, specific information not about a specific case, let's say, probably, but uh, case studies or other information or other legislation that's coming down the road, as you mentioned. So they can be um, there, I think, have a very unique position in having so much specialized knowledge. And it's really important if they can just share a little bit of that, that will be of huge benefit uh, to them and to their clients. And the idea of just to, you know, kind of give away good, pertinent information to gather, you know, that's the best way to get referrals, clients, and, you know, leads and stuff like that. Yeah, and I would just close out by saying, don't talk about yourself. Don't tell us that you're a super lawyer or that you were selected as a best lawyer or that, you know, I mean, that's just, to me, that's garbage. That's all about you. People don't really care. What they do care about is results and your reputation, and that doesn't necessarily measure your reputation. A lot of mm -hmm. what lawyers are putting out there on social media is very ego-based, and they need to redirect that energy into client-based. Everything they put out that has to have value 
because it all it takes is one tweet or one Facebook post or one post on LinkedIn to turn somebody off to say, you know what, that person's full of himself. And by the way, I'm probably guilty of that sometimes myself, but I've learned over the years to be more value-centered rather than me-centered. It's, and it's, it's a balance. People will uh, believe in you if you're giving them something regularly uh, of value. They're not going to believe in you and buy into you if all you do is talk about how great you are. Right. That, that's the key. And that's really kind of how it works in the real world. If you're going to a cocktail party and you're talking about yourself, people are not going to be very interested. If you um, talk about something that's of interest to them, ask them questions, interact with them, that's really the whole key. It's, it's social media, but it's really just being, that's how you would be in real life. And I think that's an important aspect to remember. Give information away, give good information away, and give something that's of interest to people. Yeah, thank you for that because you reminded me. I was at a trade expo in Brooklyn today, and it, it, it made me realize how important it is to really get out there face to face uh, to meet people. And I had a great time uh, interacting with colleagues, potential new business. It was just interesting. And, and I remember when I, before I went in there, I said to myself, I'm going to show an interest in them. I'm going to find, so I went up to one attorney, and, and this is the beauty of the internet and, and mobile phones. I saw his booth at this expo, Steve, and I looked him up on LinkedIn, and I went up and introduced myself and said, congratulations, I see you got an award from an agency that I used to work at, congratulations. He looked at me like, but it was an icebreaker, and we had a conversation. We had a conversation about doing business. And so it's just a great way to use these tools that are out there. So anybody who says, oh, I don't like technology, is misguided, because that, if you're at an expo, and you're trying to make a connection with somebody, uh, on either side of the business, it's good to know something about them. I didn't know this person until I looked them up. Literally, I was standing right next to his booth. <laughs> I looked him up on LinkedIn, on my iPhone. I put my iPhone away and started the conversation. I already knew a lot about him and what he did. He was impressed. Mm -hmm. And we had it, so we started the dialogue. So yeah, you're exactly right. And that's the kind of conversations we should be having in person and on social media. So we've digressed a little bit today, gone all over the place, but I think we've done a good job on keeping to repeat the the area of your reputation and what, what that means for lawyers today. And those of you who are not using social media, who are not concerned about your online reputation, folks, it is the only reputation to be concerned about. Uh, reputation is about your online reputation today. They're not going to the Martindale Hubble books anymore. They're looking for you online. They're looking for you on social media. They're looking for what, you, what you're saying and what you could teach them before they even retain you. So. Make sure you have good content up there. If you have a crisis, you want to find ways to push it down. You want to look for good SEO people like Steve and a good crisis management person to help you navigate that crisis at all stages. So with that, Steve, any closing thoughts? Uh, thank you very much. That's it. I think it was great, uh, great to talk with you as always. It always is. And we'll get together soon in the city. Uh, for those of you watching the show, uh, the website is www.thecrisisshow.com. If you want to tweet about anything you heard from Steve or I, uh, please use hashtag The Crisis Show or at The Crisis Show. That's our uh, Twitter account. So, Steve, thank you so much for being a guest today. To our viewers, thank yeah. you so much. We really appreciate you watching us live or on tape. And that's the beauty of this technology. You can watch this show anytime, and this show is going to be up permanently, we hope, as long as YouTube's around, uh, up on YouTube. Uh, we have a channel called The Crisis Show channel on YouTube, as well as on Google Hangouts on Air. So uh, if you type in The Crisis Show, you will find this episode and the other, I think it's 33 episodes. I've lost track. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. Steve, thanks again. Have a good night.